Thank you. So, uh, so, mind you, we're at the point where uh, uh, we've uh, defined this uh, generalization of, uh, or to functional extension of Brun Minkowski, uh, saw that it's, uh, it's powerful, and we'll prove it now. And the proof will use the Brun Minkowski inequality, which is why I left it there. Yes. So, you said it's a generalization, is it obvious to say? Yeah. Uh, uh, good. Uh, no, I shouldn't say, I, I, I said extension, but okay. in fact, you can prove uh, each from the other. I will only prove this from Brunmankowski, but this applied uh, will also give you, give you the other way around. It takes more. Uh, right. So, um, yeah, so if we were to think of, uh, you know, think of a slightly weaker statement here, which says that the volume is a log concave function. Instead of saying that the one over n of the volume is a concave function, which is a stronger statement, then it's just a special case of that, where, where, we, where we use these functions to be the, the section volumes. Uh, but it's nice that using the dimension, we can get a stronger statement. OK, so, uh, okay, so let's just prove this. And uh, uh, for that, uh, it's again going to be an induction. And, but this time, there are no boxes. The induction is on the dimension n, right? So the first step is for n equal to 1. Uh, given functions like this, we'd like to conclude this for dimension 1. So um, the, the only sort of um, um, uh, concept idea is to say that, look, you can think of the integral of a function as also an integral over volumes of level sets. That's it. Or if you think about probabilities, the expectation is also the integral of the probability that you're bigger than something. So uh, we'll just define the level set. Of, so we have these functions f, g, h. For each of them, we'll define the level set h for a non-negative number t to be the set of points where the function value is at least t. Okay. And uh, so the integral of h itself is uh, the integral of uh, over t of the volume of the level set of t. At some point when t is high enough, there's nothing left and it goes to zero, but I can describe that. Um, okay. Now, now, here is the... the Sorry. Shouldn't h be non-negative for this to... Yes, yes. The, 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 the whole theorem is for non-negative functions. Sorry. Yeah, the whole theorem is for non-negative functions. Yeah, good. So um, now, what can we say about these level sets for the three functions, given the property? Well, the only thing we're going to claim is that the level set of this includes the convex combinations of the corresponding level sets. So lambda L f of t plus 1 minus lambda L g of t. This is clear because if f is bigger than t and g is bigger than t, this implies that h is bigger than t, just from the So the level set contains this. So we can use now to bound the volume, the Brunner-Minkowski inequality in one dimension, <coughs> uh, and say what? That this is at least lambda times <coughs> volume of level set of f of t right, plus volume of level set of g of t. Or minus lambda. So I'll separate the integrals. Okay. And this is just again it's lambda integral of f plus 1 minus lambda integral of g, which is uh, uh, certainly bigger than. This is just the one-dimensional case. OK, okay that, that was good. And now we don't need the Brun-Minkowski theorem anymore. So, so, uh, so you used only Brun-Minkowski for n equals to 1. Yes. Then you said you can actually linearize this. Uh, oh, uh, I'm not going to do that proof. For right, this, right. Yeah. But in principle, it, so, so there's... No, to read it out, we need the higher-dimensional version, which we will now prove. I see. Okay, 
So, um, general N, right, sir? Yes. So uh, are, you, are you integral super level set? You're, 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 you're define, it's not, it's not sections, you are doing everything above it. Yeah. Is that, is that, is that formula correct? Integral? Yeah, I mean, uh, let's say I have a function, I don't know, this is h. Okay, and I want to know its integral. So uh, what I'm doing is, uh, uh, look, this is t. Oh, sorry, this is... Uh, t is a one-dimensional function, so we're looking at, uh, uh, we're counting like this, right? So normally you do integral of h, which is this. This is h of, n, h of x, right? And instead you can count by horizontal lines. Each horizontal line is exactly the volume of Lt. Right, but you're defining your hx is not equal to t, but h uh, hx bigger or equal to t. Uh, Everything above it. Oh, right. Uh, did I? It's the weight of the segment that fits underneath the curve, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's still a set over here. This, the, our domain is only R. Our domain is not uh, uh, the plane. These are one-dimensional functions. So it could be, you know, this, the, whatever is the, the largest one, the union of all the things above T. That's, that's what we're counting as yours. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is the, this is the uh, uh, one dimensional version. Now to do it for high dimension, we're going to use induction, right? So we're gonna, I'm gonna define a projection to one dimension lower. So for general n, um, so suppose I have x, y in our n minus one now and alpha, beta, real numbers. Uh, then all I want to do is define this function h of gamma x, similarly for f and g, to be the original h evaluated at x comma gamma. Gamma is a real number, which is one dimension lower. We're thinking of them as n minus one dimensional functions where I fixed one coordinate. Now, if we do this and I choose, fix some lambda, Fix this, and let's pick gamma to be lambda alpha plus one minus lambda beta. This is just for convenience, so I'm not writing that the whole time. And I'm now going to look at h of, you see this, this h of um, uh, gamma at the convex combination. Okay. And uh, I want to say that it satisfies the hypothesis of the of the theorem, and, of, and therefore by the induction hypothesis we'll get this conclusion. That's the plan. Okay. For every fixed alpha, beta, and lambda, this is a lower dimensional function. If it satisfies the hypothesis of the Prokopov Landreth theorem, we will use the induction hypothesis and argue that the integrals satisfy the conclusion. Okay, that won't complete the proof because we still need to worry about the gammas, but we'll do that. Okay, so this is just by definition h of lambda x plus one minus lambda y comma lambda alpha plus one minus lambda theta, which we know by assumption on the function h is at least um, uh, f of x comma alpha to the lambda times uh, g of uh, y comma beta to the one minus lambda, which we can write at uh, f alpha x to the lambda times g beta y to the one minus lambda. So for every fixed alpha, beta, and lambda, the function h gamma satisfies, satisfies this for all x, y. Therefore, by the induction hypothesis, for this is an n minus one dimensional function, we can conclude that the integral of h gamma is at least the integral of f alpha to the lambda times the integral of g beta to the one minus lambda. So this hasn't finished everything because we have fixed certain we have fixed we have fixed uh, alpha beta right? Fix this, but at least n minus one dimension. That's what the induction hypothesis says. Now we need to do one more step. It's going to use the one-dimensional proof again. So what would the last step be? We have to which which one-dimensional function should we apply it to? Again, we need a hypothesis that looks like this, 
and a conclusion that should now look like the final conclusion in n dimensions. <coughs> right? So we will just define this integral itself. Right? So in other words, define h of gamma to be the integral of h gamma over all of rn minus 1. So it's the n minus, for a fixed gamma, it's the rn minus 1 dimensional. Now, from the, from the conclusion from the induction hypothesis, we get that h of lambda alpha plus 1 minus lambda beta is at least capital F defined similarly of alpha to the lambda times capital G <coughs> beta to the 1 minus lambda. This is just what we got. Now, let's apply the one-dimensional version to this. To, to the functions capital H, capital F, and capital G. To conclude that the integral over capital H, over just all real numbers, is at least the integral over capital F to the lambda, integral over capital G to the 1 minus lambda. But this, of course, is the same as the integral over R to the n of H itself. And so, so that's the conclusion of the theory. So, these are all term by term equal. Cut and paste. So, how yes. many times was Rune and Kowski used in this proof? Was it twice? Uh, or just once. No, but in the induction step, only once? I didn't use it in the induction step. I used the induction hypothesis in the induction step. Okay, there was no Brunner. There was only, it was only used, uh, I mean, of course, induction hypothesis is implicitly. I, I understand that, it was yeah. just, uh, yeah. see. okay. So you used two different types of induction, one from n minus one and one from one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we had to combine it two ways to get the final conclusion, right? Are we using the fact that this thing, hypothesis, holds for every lambda in zero, one, or are we using it for no, one fixed lambda? Fixed lambda. Lambda, we can think of as fixed for the entire proof. So if I just know the uh, hypothesis for lambda... For fixed lambda, third, it's still true. Yes. It's still true. Okay. Yes. So it, it's, uh, yes. So would it be fair to say that, please, according to this proof, we can put an arbitrary set and it has to be... Uh, uh, I mean, look, we're taking these combinations here, right? No, when we're integrating over uh, Rn, it has to be... It has to contain the entire real line. Otherwise, the first part of the proof, because we're doing integration yeah. over T... Yeah. yeah, we might be able to get some weak extension, but not the yeah. other. Yeah. That's right. Um, okay, so that's the proof here. We already saw the applications. Um, and uh, what we'll do now is actually move to concentration, and we'll prove concentration using Prekopa Linder. Okay. <coughs> um, so let me state the concentration here. I'll leave the I'll leave this this part up. This is the type of, uh, you know, the illustrative classical theorem. Um, Levy uh, says, suppose now I take a function. This is about concentration of functions around their mean or median. Um, if I take a function defined on the sphere, uh, a real value function, and uh, I, the question I want to ask is, how well does it concentrate near its mean? So what is the probability? that f of x, it's, it's, it's over drawn uniformly from the sphere, deviates from its expectation by more than some t. Right? This, is the, this is the type of, uh, I don't know which you prefer, but this is the type of inequality we want to prove. Okay, now, in general, this is going to be, can't say anything, but we will assume that the function f is Lipschitz. L Lipschitz. Right? So if you change the argument by distance in, in Euclidean norm. We change by distance 
uh, one, it will change at most by L. Uh, so, so for example, length on the sphere changes only by, 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 by is one unit. So this is going to be now less than uh, twice e to the minus uh, uh, n t squared over 2. Okay, so you get this exponential concentration near the mean. L, L is L, there is also an L squared here, sorry. <coughs> when I prove, I will assume L is 1, but let's keep the term correct. Yeah. Okay. In particular, if f is the length function, then it, uh, yeah, it's all wrong. Uh, okay, so we want to prove something like this. Now, you can state this also for other distributions, right? Y uniform over the sphere. This is a nice fact here. We'll see two different proofs, one proof and one proof uh, sketch. Um, but let me state, it, uh, state a different version of the sphere. It's slightly weaker than what, what one can prove, which is uh, oh, um, the following. So uh, let's let me take any subset of the sphere again. And... Uh, 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 no, not not the sphere, just Rn. Sorry, excuse me. So that's what that's what makes it a different version. So we'll prove a similar statement, not over uniform over the sphere, but over Gauss lens. That's uh, that, that's uh, that's the version that will be more convenient to carry around with us later. Uh, and so um, this, so this is some subset of space A, and it'll be interesting to mark out all of the all of space that's close to this, where the distance is at most t to this. Okay. So a t will be the set of all points where the distance to this subset is at most. And gamma of x is just the Gaussian density. I'll, I'll drop the subscript n, but in n dimensions, so you know, 2 pi to the n over 2 and e to the minus standard Gaussian density. Now, the, the statement is that the measure, the, the, the Gaussian measure of A, so the integral of this over A, times the integral over all of R to the N of exponential in the distance from X to A squared over 4, times, again, here, gamma. So, integrated over the Gaussian measure, is at most 1. This is the version we prove. Now, there's always this choice. You know, should I motivate this version by showing its application first or just prove it first? And I don't know if there is a good answer to this. Uh, so there's no AT in this statement? Uh, uh, th there is no AT in this statement, indeed. Uh, why did I define AT? Good point. So <laughs> this is a lemma. And from this lemma, the conclusion we'll get about AT is that the measure of a t uh, of a times the measure of a t complement, so what's far from the set, is at most e to the minus t squared over 4. OK, good. So this is actually the application. Okay. So this, this, this you'll be happy with. It's of independent interest. right? Uh, uh, the measure of any subset times the measure of what's far from it is small. So if your set is large, what's far from it must be very small. In particular, if gamma a is, say, a 1 half, so you have a Gaussian measure 1 half set, you go out distance t, you're left with only exponential in t squared. Okay. Why does this follow from this? Uh, look at this integral here. And uh, let's only count this integral over uh, points uh, that are uh, uh, in a t complement. So the distance will be at least t for each of them. So you get e to the t squared over 4, which I just pull out. And then what's left is just the integral over at. So this directly implies the conclusion. OK, that's the actual. And that implies that. Uh, uh, it's close, yeah, up to constants, right? Right, so, so that is gamma of a? The measure, the Gaussian measure. So oh, gamma okay. of a set is just uh, integral over the set of the Gaussian measure. Okay, sure, thanks. Okay, so, so let's prove this. This is where the idea is, and then 
and then you get that. Uh, um, yeah. So how do we prove this? We're going to use uh, Prokop Alignor. We're just going to apply this theorem once, no induction. <laughs> and so I just have to choose the functions carefully, right? F, G, and H. So uh, let me give you a hint. F will map to this one. G will map to this one. I mean, the integrals, obviously. This will be the conclusion, right? So the conclusion will be about integrals. And H will map to this one. Okay. So what should we define them to be? F is of x is just going to be the indicator function of the set A. So it's 1 if you're in the set A times the Gaussian density. So that the integral of f is gamma a. g is going to be this uh, e to the distance x a squared over 4 times gamma x. And what will h be? Can you, do you want to use y for the value? Or should we, are you using the same variable for f and g? Uh, I mean, these are functions. I'm just defining functions now. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> at the end of the lecture, I realized, oh, he was right. I should have used it. But, but right now, I don't see <laughs> the benefit. Well, H of x should be, should be what? Just gamma of x, the Gaussian means. So at least with these settings, if we had the conclusion of the prokopa line theorem, we would, that, is, that is simply this. Integral of h, which is 1, is at least integral of g, which is this quantity times integral of okay. okay? Are you okay with this? Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, now I, what do I need to do? Just show that these functions satisfy the, the condition of the, of, the, of, the, of the theorem. So in fact, we don't, need, we're not, we don't need it for every lambda. So the question, we'll just do lambda equals 1 half. Okay, we'll just do lambda equals 1 half. So I want to show that this is true for lambda equals 1 half, which means what? that um, f at a point x right, times uh, to the power 1 half times g at a point y to the power 1 half is at most h at the point x plus y over 2. That's it. That's all we need to prove. Okay. So let's uh, verify that. Uh, I know we know what the right hand side is. That's just e to the minus x plus y over 2 length squared over 2. Okay, I'll ignore the, I'll ignore the constant for the Gaussian density. It's the same everywhere. And then uh, what about the left-hand side? f of x to the half. Well, let's see. If x is not in A, then it's trivial because it's just 0 on the left. So we can assume x is in A. And if x is in A, then I can ignore this indicator and I just get gamma. So you get e to the minus x squared over 2. That's for the f contribution. And then g, you get this, which is how much? Now, g of y, right? Now, y, um, the distance to a of y is certainly less than um, uh, 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 x minus y just because x is one of the points in, in A. Right? That's the only bound we'll use. So if I use that bound here and put here an upper bound on the left-hand side, I'm going to get here e to the power of x minus y squared over 4 right? for the distance bound, and then times the Gaussian density at y, which is y squared over 2. And now, amazingly, this is an equality. OK, complete the squares. Yeah, okay, so it's satisfied and the conclusion is done. Yes? How much we can extend this for other uh, PDFs other than Gaussian? Oh, yeah, so, so, so uh, very good question. We'll get to that towards the end. Um, uh, for example, one could hope for proving this for all log concave functions. Okay, and I'll state what's true and what's, uh, what's hoped for. Um, but for the sphere and the Gaussian, you get this uh, Gaussian type DK, which is the best you can hope for in general. Okay, so that's uh, 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 concentration. 
Now we'll move to an application of concentration, which is a whole area on its own. Um, Sorry, man. Yes. So where was the, um, the connection with this and the levy? This is levy. Oh, oh, uh, how do you, from here to here? Yeah, uh, yeah you see, um, uh, uh, Gaussian is spherically symmetric. So you can uh, prove either one from either one if you want. Uh, so what would be L? Here is one, right? L is one for the, for the, yes, exactly. But you see, if your function was, sorry, I didn't prove it for the L Lipschitz version, but let me at least just say a few words. Uh, what did we use here? We used only this bound on this distance. If your function is L Lipschitz, then your distance is going to be at most the function value divided by L. So the distance squared will be function value squared divided by L squared. That's it. That's it. You get the whole conclusion. You meant the function version, yes. With the median. Yes, and uh, you know, it turns out the median, yeah. Median and mean. I'll take one more step. Okay, so next question is, uh, is concentration. I mean, not concentration. These, these uh, Dvoretsky sections, for which I will... We don't need this anymore. Okay. Uh, so, just a bit of uh, recap on these uh, 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 this, these types of considerations. So, for this part of the talk, well, let's consider only symmetric convex bodies. Um, Right, so we assume that uh, 0 is in the body, and if x is in the body, then so is minus x. Now, um, uh, each such convex body defines a norm, uh, a distance. So this norm for point x with respect to the co symmetric convex body k is just uh, the smallest scaling of the body that contains the point. So the the minimum overall t such that x belongs to tk. Yeah. Minimum t such that x belongs to tk. That's the. You need the interior of k to be non empty. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So, so let's assume that this has volume. So convex body, but anyway. Um, <coughs> okay. Now, um, you know, so we are certainly familiar with some. So if you talk about this, the corresponding body is just the Euclidean ball. And if we talk about uh, this, then it's uh, the L1 ball. And if we talk about this, then it's the cube and so on. Now, um, and by this I mean uh, the set of all x where the summation of xi uh, um, is uh, less than or equal to So now also useful to observe is that if you have this relationship between norms like we have x infinity is less than or equal to x2 always, what this implies is that the corresponding body here, B infinity, right, actually contains B2. It's reverse, right, because uh, the bigger one is the one unit. So to you get the smaller one, you, you only shrink, yeah. And then similarly, this is less than x1. So, against uh, b1n ball. All right, just a quick recap of these things. Now, a theorem that's uh, classical and very useful in this field is uh, John's theorem, uh, one of many uh, useful theorems. Uh, which says that um, for any such symmetric K, symmetric convex body K, there exists an ellipsoid E such that um, this is contained in K and only a square root n scaling contains K. as we know is true for uh, say x2 and x1. Uh, e, yes. <laughs> no, thank you. 
<laughs> slightly less trivial, yeah. Okay. Um, now, um, if you didn't have symmetry, just to state this part of it, you don't get the square root. Uh, this is tight, best possible, and it's easy to define the ellipsoid. This ellipsoid is just the maximum volume ellipsoid in K and Euclidean volume. And this, this is going to give you this. Okay. Uh, so we have this uh, root n relationship between any two of these norms. Um, but it's rooted, and it's really it's real. I mean, uh, there are bodies that you really just can't fit into the Euclidean ball unless you scale the ball by rooted, like uh, the cube. I mean, the 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 L1 ball. Now, uh, the consideration is the following. Okay, I can't fit the entire thing, but I really want to have something that looks like a ball. How large a section can you find that looks like a ball? So, let me put that up. Um, yeah, so what's the largest dimension k? So that k has a section that's almost Euclidean. So that's the question. What is the largest dimension? So this is just an integer k, such that your convex body k has a Euclidean nearly Euclidean, has a, I'll make it precise, nearly Euclidean section of dimension. Okay. So, so that means that there exists some subspace uh, E, so that if I look at K intersect E, so that's the section, the subspace, uh, it's sandwiched between two balls, and now we mean Euclidean balls, uh, or let's, where they, you're only changing the, the factor by an epsilon. You pick the epsilon. You pick the epsilon, and you'd like to sand, find a section that basically looks like a ball up to epsilon. Okay. So you've got some complicated body, but there's a section here, and on this section, you just have to distort a little bit to catch the entire thing. Ball or ellipsoid? Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, in fact, it's true for balls. What we, the, for these ex the, the extremal bounds that we'll prove uh, that, 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 that are true, uh, are, are true for balls. Uh, now, now um, in fact, in general, you can find an ellipsoid that's better than the ball, but, but as far as the worst case is concerned, you could have just said ball. So tell us about the notation. K sec E, yeah. and then what are you Yeah, there is no absolute value here. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, and the question is, for given an epsilon, what is the largest K? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so you want K as a function of epsilon. In fact, now I'll state the theorem. Um, this theorem uh, is, the, this is a result of men, a lot of work in convex geometry and functional analysis, uh, um, influenced the field heavily, but basically K is at least epsilon squared constant, epsilon squared log 1 over epsilon times log n. So this, uh, we started with a body in k-dimensional space. This is in Rn. Okay, so there's a log n dimensional section, which is almost Euclidean. This is tight. This, this is tight. Uh, up to the, up, this is, log n is tight. The function of epsilon is still not tight, or not known to be tight. Um, now, in fact, uh, uh, we can say this, uh, so I'll just write this as C of epsilon times log n. Just, yes. This is still symmetric body and symmetric. this is through the origin? Yes. So it's not a section in the corner of the... No, 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 subspace. So we are going through the origin, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, it's not a single point. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so now there is a nice, uh, a generalized way to state this. This is the worst case over all bodies. 
you see, for many bodies, you expect you get big, bigger sections and so on. So there's a nice way to state this more generally, uh, sometimes called the generalized Zuretsky, which says, let me look at the following quantity. Uh, I'll define M to be the expectation over just the sphere of the length of x according to your norm. So if I pick a random unit vector, what is the length in your norm? Okay, whatever it is. Um, and uh, then, and also assume that your norm is no larger than some factor b times the Euclidean norm. Right? So b is something. b might be root n. b is whatever. So b could be 1 if you scale down. Under these circumstances, you have two parameters, m and b. This dimension k is at least c of epsilon. I'll keep that, actually I can write down the same function, so let me write it down. C times epsilon squared over log 1 over epsilon times n times m over b squared. It'll, it'll make sense in a minute because I'm going to c c carry out some examples. Um, alternatively, this is just an alternative version. Um, computations are easier. Um, instead of defining this expectation over the sphere, we'll define it over a Gaussian. So let me define L to be the expectation over a Gaussian of the norm of x, k. And again, it's cleaner to have the square into the one half. But up, this is the same as up to a constant, the actual absolute value. So it makes no difference up to constants this. Uh, and then if you do it like this, then here you get k is uh, same function of epsilon times L over b squared. The n goes away. And that's no surprise because, in fact, this uh, L is up to a constant square root n times n. <laughs> okay, so if you take an expectation over a Gaussian or over a sphere, these are spherically symmetric things. The only thing you're worried about is how much scaling you need to in each direction, and that's that's controlled over there. Okay, so this is this is the this these are the versions of the theorem. Now, what does it say for specific balls of interest? And then, and then uh, yeah, we still have time to prove it. So um, let's take the two of the most common examples. I'll do it here. Say the L1 ball. And we can do the computations at the end there. So if you have the L1 ball, uh, uh, what is the first question is, what is B? Right? X1 fits in square root n times x2. Right? The L1 length could be root n times. For a unit vector, the L1 length could be, could be root n times. All 1 over root n, for example. So B is root n. And then the next estimate is, what is the L1 length square to the 1 half for a random unit vector? So I'm picking a random unit vector on the sphere and asking, what's this length going to be about? Right? The L1 length. So what is it going to be? Not a sphere, Gaussian. Gaussian. Sorry, Gaussian. Right? So I picked a random Gaussian, and I'm asking, what is the length squared but in one norm? Okay. Uh, to the one half, fine. And this is about n. Why? Because you see, this is the summation of the coordinates here. If you think of each coordinate, it's, it's about a constant. So you get constant times n for just the length. And, and uh, square to the one half affects the whole thing only by a constant. So the L in this case is about n. The B is root n. So if you substitute over there, you get that the section for this case is some constant depending on epsilon <coughs> times n. So for the L1 ball, take the L1 ball, there are sections of constant times n dimension which look just like Euclidean balls. You do the same computation with L infinity, this gives you only log n. Well, let's just do it. If I do L infinity, second example, L infinity, then the infinity norm is just less than the, the two norm. So b is 1. b is 1. And now we're just asking, 
what is the expected maximum coordinate right square for a unit vector so I'll, I'll still write it as infinity here square to the one half where x is a Gaussian vector that's if I pick a Gaussian vector the maximum coordinate should be about root log n and in fact this is true in expectation also if you take the max and take the expectation of the max you still get root log n so if you put that in you get the log n and this in fact is the worst case not just for L infinity but for all uh, 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 convex bodies and the proof of that just goes by showing that if you take any convex body you can actually find an n over 2 dimensional uh, L infinity ball in there and then that has within it a log n dimensional section yes um, so is there a general way to see what happens if you change k from say 1 to infinity um, like oh yeah it gets closer is it getting closer uh, to as you know, go through two. Yeah, yeah. So, so for a general p norm here, uh, you know, the dimension here, instead of being so, it was for for l equal to one, this was n, and here it's root log n. In general, it's n to the uh, uh, two over q for a p p norm if p is bigger than p is bigger than one. Uh, there must be an expert who will make sure I'm saying this right. Uh, yeah, times the same c over epsilon factors, but yeah, it it, it degrades uh, smooth. Yeah. So, uh, anything between one and two, it's still it's still some function of epsilon times n. The function of epsilon in these proofs is the same, and we don't know if it's optimal. Uh, 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 as you go between one and two, I think it already starts deteriorating a little bit, but it remains a polynomial in n. It remains a polynomial length for any, so this much is true, it remains a polynomial length for any, any p, fixed p. Yeah. Okay, uh, 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 so the proof. Okay, uh, how are we going to do this? And how are we going to prove that uh, a convex body has a very large Euclidean section? What we'll prove is uh, this version here, which says uh, in terms of the expected value of the length. Yeah, there is a large section, the dimension grows as some function of epsilon times this, uh, this uh, expected length in your norm. Okay. Um, how are we going to prove this? Which section should we pick? I mean, we have to figure out a section to pick, right? So which section should we pick? The hint is that we'll use the previous theorem. A random section, yes. So we'll just pick a random section. Uh, and so, um, uh, the point is, is so, so here's how the proof goes. Um, so we'll just, we're going to pick a, uh, a, a random k-dimensional section. We're going to choose the value of k, of course, carefully. And so in, in fact, the proof will conclude that most sections have this property. Of this dimension, most sections. You can control the probability. Right, so, so it's just a probabilistic uh, argument. Pick a random section, it contains this large section. And in case you're interested in, I think a very interesting open problem, it's open to construct one. So you know they exist, but to find one, even for, the, for, for, for these uh, special cases, matching the bound that we know exists is, is open. Um, okay, so, 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 so why is this gonna be useful? So our plan is this. First you take a fixed x. Okay. No, uh, 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 and now we'll rotate it randomly. Apply random rotation. So, uh, so, so now the distribution of x is uniform on Sn. Okay, so we've got a random vector. Now this random vector will apply a Levy theorem here and say that the probability that, so we're going to apply Levy to the function f of x equals the norm of x in our norm. Okay? So the probability that this deviates from its expectation, which was the definition of m, by more than, and we'll choose this threshold to be epsilon m, is less than e to the minus um, n uh, epsilon squared m squared over 2, 
I'm going to skip the L. Let's assume it's, it's, it's one Lipschitz. So let's assume that we have scaled K so that XK is less than or equal to X2. So this we just get from Levy. We haven't done anything, anything else. This is for a single point, single random point. Okay. Now we need to prove, but this is exactly what we need to prove, but for the entire section. Hey, I mean, look what this is saying. This is saying that the norm of xk lies between 1 plus epsilon times m, its expectation, and 1 minus epsilon times m, its expectation, which are fixed values, so it's going to be like a ball. Okay, so with high probability, it's like, it's, it's, it's within a Euclidean ball here. Um, so uh, that's for one point. Though. Now we need to argue for a k-dimensional section. How are we going to argue for a k-dimensional section? Well, we'll just use an epsilon net. Okay, for s to the k minus one for the sphere. So we'll pick a net of points n such that for every x on the sphere, there exists a y in the net, so that the distance between x and y is less than epsilon. You might have to make epsilon over 4 at the end, but... It's Euclidean distance, a k distance? Euclidean distance. Just a Euclidean, Euclidean uh, net. Um, yeah, so by our assumption, that's a weaker thing, but yeah. So, such a net is used in many things. Probably you've seen this a couple of times in this, in this workshop. But uh, the size of the net in order to achieve this, so lemma is only 1 plus 2 over epsilon to the k. Uh, and the reason is uh, you just pick a greedy, greedily pick the net. Start with a point. If there is a point that's not close enough to the net so far, pick it and, and keep doing this uh, till all points have been covered. Now when you do this, you see that the, 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 your centers, uh, by, the choice, by the fact that they are being picked really, the balls of radius epsilon over 2 around them must be disjoint. Balls of radius epsilon over 2 must be disjoint because otherwise we wouldn't have, it was already inside a ball of radius epsilon. So around each net point uh, y, if you take the epsilon over 2 ball, these are disjoint. Moreover, all of them, these balls, are all contained in uh, the ball, the, the unit sphere extended out by epsilon over 2. So 1 plus epsilon over 2 times v2. Therefore, the size of the net is at most uh, the volume of the outer thing, which is 1 plus epsilon over 2 to the, no, not n here, k now, to the k divided by volume of each one, which is now radius epsilon over 2, so epsilon over 2 to the k, which gives you the 1 plus 2 over epsilon to the k bar. Okay, so it's just a packing argument. Okay, so that's the number. Now let's go back here. We want to combine this number and do a union bound with this. That'll, that'll be enough to conclude the theorem. Um, I guess I should do it here. Um, so, combining these two, these two parts, um, and then there's a third part which says that if it's true for every point on the net, it's true for every point uh, on the sphere, but that's just because you're only moving by epsilon, so your function can't change by more than epsilon. It's a one Lipschitz function. So that's the, that's the third part of usually for any net argument, but, but certainly here too. So now, putting these two together, uh, the probability that uh, uh, that this holds, conclusion holds, for all uh, x in the net is uh, at least 1 minus, well, the size of the net times the bound we have for each one. So twice e to the minus epsilon squared m squared n over 2. And n is... Um, uh, this bound here to 1 plus 2 over epsilon to the k. This is k, and that's n. And so if I choose k to be 
as we said, some constant times epsilon squared over log 1 over epsilon to take care of this times n times m squared. We, we have, you know, say half probability. So this is bigger than 1 half. That's the core of this argument. It's a probabilistic argument. <coughs> okay. Now, um, yeah, questions are welcome. We have a few more minutes, and I was going to talk about isoperimetry, which is another way uh, to address things like levy and prove more general concentration inequalities. Um, yeah. So we are here. The part I didn't do about Duretsky is to show you that the quantities m or l are bounded for any convex body. I, I only mentioned the outline that you can find a large L1 section, and then for L1, we can estimate explicitly. But otherwise, the proof is complete. Uh, OK, isoperimetry. So isoperimetry is the following general consideration. If you have a subset of some volume, um, so, you know, you, uh, uh, what is the, so OK, so here's, here's the, let you think about it. You know, you have the cake cutting problem, the usual cake cutting problem where uh, you have a cake, you want to share it, and uh, uh, so one person cuts, the other person chooses. Uh, seems to be fair, assuming each wants to get the most. Um, uh, but then, you know, isoperimetry is a different problem. In fact, to illustrate it, I have a broader um, something to illustrate. Which is, um, mind passing these around? <laughs> uh, isoperimetry is the avocado cutting problem. <laughs> okay. I, I love avocados. I'm sure most of you do. One of my top ten discoveries of coming to the U.S. But um, uh, please take one. You're welcome to keep it. Uh, but don't eat it yet. Uh, so the point is this. What is the avocado cutting problem? You want to eat, I don't know, half your avocado, 30% of your avocado. So you cut it. You eat it. And what do you do with the rest? You put it in the fridge, right? And then you come back the next day. What happens? <laughs> this is this uh, film. You've got to get rid of it. Do something like that. So what would you like to do? Make a cut of whatever fraction you want, 30%, 40%, that's you, up to you. But that minimizes the surface area. <laughs> that's the avocado cutting problem. And we're talking about the avocado cutting problem in high dimension. Okay, that's it. That, that's all I want, okay? So how should you cut an avocado in high dimension so as to minimize the surface area and get the fraction you care about? Okay? It's very, very, very practical. Foundations of data science. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, here is the, the, the general problem. Suppose I have some measure p in uh, n-dimensional space, okay, function with bounded integral, and uh, I'm interested in finding the minimum over all subsets of the boundary of this subset divided by the smaller of the two. So if, for example, your measure was the uniform over a convex body, for example, an avocado, you could uh, talk about some subset and ask, what is the ratio of the boundary to the volume of this, whichever is smaller? OK? Now, what's the answer? So for the two cases we worked out for levies, the answer is very clean and classical. For a sphere, if you talk about subsets of the sphere, any subset, or a Gaussian, or draw Gaussian. Uh, it's also classical. And the answer is a half space. It's just a half space. No matter what fraction you want, there is a half space that will give you the best cut. So in the case of a sphere, it will give you a lower dimensional sphere. In the case of a Gaussian, it'll, it's just one part of a Gaussian. That's optimal. Actually, this already lets us prove the strongest version of Levy you can imagine, if you, if you prove this isoperimetric inequality. Because what is it saying? Suppose you want to know what, you have some subset A, and you want to know what is a distance more than t from it. Well, the way, one way to do it is, let me choose this A to minimize the boundary, and then I go out distance t, so I've captured as little as possible near it, and then the question is what's left. But this is exactly the band problem that we solved, the cap volume problem that we solved in the beginning of this, of this tutorial, and so it drops off as e to the minus t squared, n t squared over 2 in the sphere, a to the minus t squared over 2 for a Gaussian. 
So concentration follows from isoperimetry in this, and in a much more general sense. But here, do we have an assumption of com complexity for the particle? Yeah, so I, we haven't said the theorem, but yes. To get anywhere, we need to say something about this measure, right? So the most general version that we can talk about is when P is log concave, right? Which cap? So if P is log concave, and the function f is L Lipschitz, What can you say about the deviation of this function from its mean or median? Okay, how, what's the probability it deviates? Uh, uh, it doesn't apply to our From the inside, there's a curve. The oh, the, the, the subset doesn't have to be convex. The subset is arbitrary. I see, yes. I picked avocados because they have cores. <laughs> 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 Good point, though. Yeah. No, no, okay. Okay? The, the, it's only the set that has to be, and that you can argue, but, yeah. Um, okay, uh, so, uh, I want to state now uh, uh, a theorem and a conjecture, and we'll stop there. Um, the, the theorem is uh, by uh, Kanan, Lovas, and Shimnowitz, and the conjecture uh, is by the same people. So, uh, Ravi is here, so you can ask him more. Uh, I, I believe he likes avocados too, but <laughs> 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 might not be the source. Okay, but the theorem is the following um, take uh, this setting here where P is log concave and uh, 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 um, uh, you're, you're asking about this minimum possible value. Let's call this value psi p, the Cheeger constant or isoperimetric constant of this distribution. And what we proved is that psi p is at least absolute constant over square root of the expected distance square from the mean. Okay. So you have some distribution. I can pick points from the distribution, and I have a expected square distance. <coughs> this is at least this. <coughs> Another way to say it is that if I were to consider psi bar p, which is the minimum over only hyperplane cuts, not all cuts, but only hyperplane cuts, right? then the point is that this cannot be much lower than that. So psi p is at least 1 over root of this, this quantity here times psi bar p, where this is for hyperplane cuts. Okay. Just humor me for one second. I'll write this theorem down, and then we'll relate everything. The, the conjecture says that psi p is um, uh, at least absolute constant times psi p bar. In other words, up to a universal constant factor for any log concave function, the best cut, which could be really complicated, is within a constant of the best hyperplane cut. So the conjecture just says hyperplanes might not be optimal. They are optimal for Gaussians and spheres. But in general, they're not, not even for the triangle, if you're depending on the ratio. But if you talk about within a universal constant, this constant might be two, we don't know. Uh, there, uh, there, is a, there is always a hyperplane that approaches the best to within universal, independent of the dimension, independent of the distribution. That's the conjecture. So, so in the top line, the, the theorem, I don't seem to be understanding it. You're saying that the big, the quantity which depends on p is appearing in both the psi bar version and the constant version. Yes. So does that imply that psi bar p is a constant in this case? Uh, no, look, I have them both here still. So. So here in the conjecture, yeah. fine, but up yeah. there, I'm trying to do a type match okay. with the two sides. Okay, good. So, uh, uh, right. Um, here's the, so let, let, let me state this, state the complete version, I mean, a, a, a clean version of this theorem. So I have a measure P. Um, let's assume that uh, it's uh, expectation over P of X is zero. And I'll finish in two minutes, I know I'm over time. And uh, let's say that the covariance matrix of x over p is A. That's some covariance matrix. 
Then the theorem says that psi p is at least constant divided by square root of the trace of a. That's it. There's no psi p bar. Um, psi bar p, and this is just an exercise, uh, is always at least constant over square root of the largest eigenvalue of a. This is the sum of eigenvalues or largest. This is just a, okay. So you get this ratio here. Theorem says that psi p itself is at least constant over square root of largest eigenvalue of a. There is a relatively recent improvement. Um, uh, this is joint work with Yim uh, Lee, building on a technique of Ronan Eldan, which says that uh, instead of trace of A, we can say that psi P is at least constant over. So this is the sum of the eigenvalues. You can say sum of the squares of the eigenvalues to the power one fourth. <coughs> which gives asymptotic improvements because when you have, let's say, the covariance matrix equal to the identity, when A is identity, then the KLS theorem says constant over root n. The KLS conjecture says constant. And this theorem says constant over n to the 1 fourth. So what we know today is that the best you can do is better than a hyperclean cut by at most n to the one fourth. But it could be that the whole thing is true. And if this conjecture is true for concentration, you get that the probability that f deviates from its expectation by more than, say, t drops off as e to the minus uh, t. There's a t here, and then Lipschitz as usual, and constant. What really happens is that that parameter, the KLS conjecture constant, just goes straight in here. So right now we have it with n to the 1 fourth, but maybe this is completely unnecessary. I should probably stop here unless we are way over time now. So. Oh, you can uh, cut it, eat it. <laughs> it's yours too. <laughs> if you got nothing from the lecture. <laughs> you realize you're not supposed to bring food into the auditorium, right? <laughs> it's not food, it's, it's a <laughs> learning tool. <laughs> <laughs>